So the curious thing is that if you take serum from anybody in the world, I think, and add it to a standard measles virus, they will neutralize that virus. <coughs> but if you take serum from around the world, they will not even neutralize this year's new flu. So flu changes its two major antigens essentially every year. There's an ancient Chinese curse, which is, may you live in interesting times. Um, and as a preparedness uh, official, this is definitely interesting times. Um, what we knew all along was that there was new influenza coming. Um, as Dr. Bloom has said, um, influenza always scares us. If you look back at the history of influenza, there have been three outbreaks per century. We haven't had our last pandemic since 1968. We knew we were due. Um, and though this is not, I think, yet uh, a pandemic, and, and who knows whether this current outbreak will become one, this is what we were planning for was the outbreak of a new strain of influenza. We're going to see the number rapidly rise, rapidly rise of confirmed cases uh, in Massachusetts, in Boston, and in Cambridge. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised about that. I think there'll be recommendations and updates on the, UA, on the Harvard University website uh, about recommendations that people stay out of classes, stay out of work, not come in uh, if they have a illness and they should see their doctor immediately uh, if they've been in contact with somebody who has the flu uh, and hey, they have such an illness. So what are the global challenges in communicating under, under, un, under uh, uncertain conditions? One challenge is the clash between the culture of science and the culture of reporting, right? So uh, people like Dean Bloom have been sitting in the lab and working and trying to characterize and develop a profile for this virus. It takes time. It's not easy. The answers are not very clear. On the other hand, reporters want certain information, right? Certainty, facts. Be clear, black and white. Don't tell me, you know, all these uh, caveats, right? So that's one of the things. And, and give it to me now. So if I'm a reporter writing for a daily newspaper, I put my story to bed around 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the evening. So don't tell me come back later, because I have to do the reporting now, because there are people waiting for this information. So they are going to report under deadline constraints, as opposed to science, which works under much more deliberate speed. These are questions that I think that we can, we can think through and learn from the current ex, uh, experience about. Um, did the, uh, the school systems that made decisions about this think about what were the alternatives? For instance, uh, rather than closing, is there a way to um, ask people on a voluntary basis to self-quarantine? People who might have been, uh, who, who are feeling, not feeling well um, to, to stop coming in as opposed to closing the whole school. How well does that work? Has that even been um, considered? And what are the consequences? Well, what happens if students don't go to school? Where do they go? Do they go to the mall? Um, is that really um, any, any better? Um, and, and what happens, you know, in, in the public health system, what happens to, to our ability to communicate in, and, and make decisions in the, in, the, in the future if you have educational officials and public health officials disagreeing with one another, as happened in Montgomery County, Maryland, in the Washington suburbs uh, just, just this week? And what does that do? How, does that undermine the, uh, the trust that people have in the public health system? I, I think it has to. Um, how do we avoid that kind of system, uh, that kind of problem um, in, in, in the future? So I think that's one example. And there are lots of things that we can learn um, from this. And we want to really develop methods for doing that in our project. We're hitting a place now of sort of a collision of demand for grain productive capacity for grain, climate change, and the use of animals for food. This all circles back, which is there is a problem in terms of how we are coping with the demand to feed our population. And if we don't deal with this confluence of food production and animal husbandry that is currently um, actually not a parallel path, but a collision path, we are likely to have not just a problem of epidemic influenza of various forms, but we're going to have a problem of mounting hunger in the world. One of the answers to the question that is implicit in how bad is this is why are more people dying in Mexico than here? And there are a lot of possibilities, and there are probably more than one answer. 
but we won't know for a while how many people were actually infected with the virus that had no symptoms at all, never showed up. That is, we don't have a denominator. We only know those who went to a hospital and those who died. And so until we know that, we really can't compare what the risks are, as Paul said, in any individual.